All right, we are nearing the end of the story of Abraham, which means we hit all the good stuff, the God coming through, God fulfilling his promises, uh, God stepping in and doing what God's been promising to do all along. So this, these are the really good parts of the story uh, where you watch God just finally um, get Abraham where he wants him and then fulfills everything that he has promised to do. So hopefully you've been enjoying this journey through Abraham's life. Hope you're learning something about it. And most importantly, I pray that God has been doing something in you because that's the most important thing. Not just through you, but what God wants to do in you. And that's the whole point of this series. And I hope you've been challenged and I hope you've thought along the way about what God is doing in your life. And hopefully you haven't missed that. Whether you're here, whether you're online, that you haven't missed what God has been doing in you through all of this as we have made this journey. So this morning's all about promise fulfilled, this promise that God gave him so many years ago that we're going to see this gap between when God gives the promise and God fulfills the promise and how Abraham is faithful all the way and that God is ready to deliver on what he has promised. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Genesis chapter 21. You can follow along with us. You can follow along the screen. If you're watching online, you can follow along right on the bottom of the screen for all the uh, lessons and all the scripture as well. All right, so here we go. So the Lord visited Sarah just as he had said he would and did for Sarah what he had promised. There are scripture verses you read through fast. This one might be one, okay? Yeah, I got to get through this story, right? Okay, God, God did what, what he said. This is really important because this is not just God did this for Sarah. Yay, yay God, go God, okay? This is what God does for us, that God did for us. Put your name in there. Forget Sarah's name for a moment. Put your name in there. God did for you just what he had promised. It's not that he just did it for Sarah, and Sarah was special, and Sarah got God's favor, and Sarah got God's promises, but you and I, well, good luck. Maybe we will someday. Uh, maybe if we have a really good week and we do everything right, we will, okay? That's what can happen. Put your name in that verse that God did for you exactly what he had promised. It's a powerful verse. It's a powerful picture uh, for the writer of Genesis to start this way and say, do you understand what the story is about? That God is going to do exactly what he said that he would do. And he showed up and did exactly what he had promised. So Sarah became pregnant and bore Abraham a son in his old age. And her old age, too, we could put in the whole story. That God did this at a perfect time because he wanted to show everybody who he was. That was this promise to Sarah that is really fulfilled at the appointed time that God had told him. Abraham named him his son, whom Sarah bore to him, Isaac. Now that name's going to be really important when we when we get to this in a second of why they chose the name Isaac. Uh, what does it mean? What's it about? There's really something important about that because of what God is doing and the way Sarah looked at this event and how Sarah processed this event and how she looked at it, there's something really significant about this name, okay? But we'll get to that in a moment. When his son Isaac was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him at just as God had commanded him to do. Now Abram, now Abraham was what? A hundred years old. Just let that set in for a moment, okay? A hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him, okay? That's not something to skip over quick, okay? Uh, I, all the dads in the room were like, well, I wasn't 100, okay? Uh, that wasn't me. That wasn't my story. But, oh, my goodness, can you just imagine that for a moment, okay? That he went 100 years, okay? He went 25 years specifically as part of this promise that God says, I'm going to build you a great nation, I'm going to do something great through you, Abraham, and everybody's going to be blessed in you. But guess what this 25 years is about, Abraham? I need to do something in you. And ultimately, everything that happens is going to be a part of blessing. 25 years from God giving the promise to God fulfilling the promise. And do you think it felt like a lot more than 25 years? Absolutely. Okay? Absolutely. Absolutely. How many of us would be willing to wait on God for 25 years? I don't know. Most of us probably know. 25 minutes, maybe, okay? 
25 hours if we must, okay? 25 days if you make me, right? That's the way it goes. We want God to act, and we want God to act now. And through this 25 years, God does this work in Abraham's life, and now he is ready to fulfill the promise and do everything that he has promised. So Sarah said, God has made me laugh. This is, this is one of those verses that it's really hard to translate. Basically what Sarah says, okay, and why they are in all this agreement about the name Isaac is because basically she is saying that God brought laughter to my life. God brought laughter to my life. Now, when we meet Sarah, where is she? She is a barren woman, okay? She has no value in her world. Uh, she basically, I, I'm telling you, she has no value. She has no worth. Everybody would have looked at her and said, Sarah, you're worth nothing. You can't bear, bear children. Uh, we don't care about you, okay? But Abraham saw something in her. Abraham marries her. And yes, throughout all of this time, okay, Sarah's got to live with the I can't have children, I can't have children, I can't have children. Everybody around me says I have no worth. So she gets to this point at the end where God fulfills this promise and gives her a child where she says, do you realize what God brought to my life? God brought laughter into my life where there was a lot of pain, where there was a lot of regrets, where there was a lot of just I don't know what's going on. God turns all of that around, and he brings this incredible laughter and joy into my life. That's ultimately what she is claiming. And then she says, everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. You will join in God bringing laughter into your life when you read the story, when you learn what God did through Sarah. Because it will remind you, oh, there's really nothing impossible with God. There is really nothing impossible with God. There's nothing that God can't do. And I can trust him to work in my life the way he has promised and work for my good and that his ultimate goal is to bring joy. Now, how many people would think God brings laughter into our lives? Okay, I'm just telling you, that's not the picture of uh, American Christianity, is it? That is not the picture of American Christianity. In fact, God takes laughter out of our lives is what most of our culture would think that God does. Okay, God takes all the fun, all the good, all the excitement, and following Jesus is boring, mundane. Uh, that, that's the enemy's deceit on everybody. So that we don't think that laughter and joy come from God, and God's desire is that into our lives. When is the last time you laughed, you had joy, and you thought it was from God? I don't know. I thought it was from the comedian, right? I thought it was the, the YouTube video I watched, okay? Uh, or, or and, and you know, uh, Stephen was into fail videos. You ever watch any of those, okay? You know, people driving their car into houses and all sorts of crazy things, okay? Love those. I don't know why, okay? I don't understand. But just watching people do crazy things, and it's all on video, okay? So it's just like this continual loop you can watch of all these crazy things, okay? That's the stuff we think that brings laughter into our lives. And we fail to remember that God desires to bring that into our life. God desires to bring joy into your life. And if you're here this morning, and if you're watching, and you understand that's God's desire, is to bring that type of joy and that type of laughter into your life, you are missing who he is. And you are missing the blessing he wants to put on your life. That following Jesus isn't about mundane, it isn't about boring. It isn't about no fun, no excitement, okay? It's our culture has defined everything in certain terms, pushed God out, and then tried to get what God wants to offer in fake ways. And I'm telling you this morning, I'm so glad you're listening to this story because I want you to have that time of, type of joy that Sarah gets to her life and said, brought that into my life. God was the source of that. God brought that. God gave that to me. She went on to say, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have given birth to a son for him in his old age. And the play on all of this is the name Isaac, where it reminded her constantly that God brought this joy into my life. And so that, that's where the name Isaac comes from. That's why they developed it, why they named him that. It's because they saw what God did, and they saw this fulfillment that God had done for him. And you need to 
through everything that God was faithful to keep his promises. Through everything. To everything they went through. To all the times that Abraham didn't do what he was supposed to do, right? To all the times he wasn't following. To the time they went to Egypt and that was a disaster. To the time they looked and said, well, we don't happen so Hagar I guess you're in this story too and produces Ishmael out of it think of all the wood bumps along the way that through everything God is faithful to keep his promises and I want you to know that God is faithful to keep his promises to you whether we whether and we're not perfect and we fall and we get off base and we make mistakes that God is faithful to keep his promise. So let me fast forward into the New Testament because quite often you'll see this where the New Testament writers will pick up the story of Abraham and then talk about it and then like give commentary on it. If you were to turn to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 11, you would find this verse. By faith, Because this is all by faith, right? This is all trusting that God is who he says he is, and he will do everything he says he'll do. That by faith, even though Sarah herself was barren, okay, can't have kids, and he was too old, okay? Isn't this a great couple? The the writer's just going to say, this is a great couple for God to work in, right? Because she's barren, he's old, it's over, right? They, They have no chance, right? They're the the perfect couple to, for God to show up and work in, Okay? Do you understand? Some of you in here, some of you listening are the perfect couple for God to show up and work in. And you'd be like, why is that? Because you're not perfect, okay? And your story is a perfect story for God to show up and work in and through. So there is no mistake that this is God. This is a perfect couple for God to show up and work in because when he's done, nobody's going to say, huh, I wonder how that happened, right? I wonder how that happened. I, what, 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 a, what lucky streak they got on so that all of this was completed. So at the end of the story, the only place you're left to turn is to say, wow, God is amazing. God is great. God is good. God is incredible. The only place for you to be at the end of the story is that. So there's this perfect couple, right? She's barren. He was too old, okay? He received the ability to procreate, that God did this. God showed up to people who were old and past anything that would uh, mark as a a, a couple ready for fertility, that God showed up and he did something here and gave them the ability to procreate because he regarded the one who had given the promise to be trustworthy. This is Abraham and Sarah, okay? They regarded the one God who had given the promise to be trustworthy, that they could trust God that God was going to do it, so they followed him along this path, seeing what would happen, seeing what would take place, and go, I don't know, God, but we're in it with you, and look at what God has done. Okay, as we've been doing every week, what are some lessons we can learn from this, okay? What what are some lessons that you and I can walk away from this story and say, okay, how then do I... Do I understand this? And how do I take this and how do I apply it to my life and my faith and my walk with Jesus? Okay, number one, God will always do what he says he will do. God will always do what he says he will do. This is really important because part of the walk of faith is for us to experience that. Part of what God wants to do in you is to confirm that. Hey, I'm going to do what I'm I'm always going to do, okay, Uh, which means I'll never leave you or forsake you. I'll never be on the other side of you. I'm on your side. I am for you. I have demonstrated that through the sacrifice of Jesus. I have shown you that. So God will do what he always says that he will do. He just will. He can't go back on it. He can't lie. He can't. He doesn't put asterisks and says, well, I was going to do that for you. But, you know, you didn't act very well and you didn't keep all the rules. And I can't do that for you. God always do what he says he will do. And you and I need to understand that so that we will push into those promises and live out of those promises when it doesn't feel like it's happening, when it doesn't feel like they're taking place. Can you imagine in 25 years how many days they woke up and went, I don't, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know. 
serenade, talking to each other. You think this is going to I don't know if this is going to happen. Is this really going to take place? I have no idea. 25 years of it, of wondering, will God do what he says that he will do? And he had done stuff along the way, and God showed himself faithful, but that ultimate promise, 25 years, waiting on and trusting that God was going to come through, and God going to do it. So they leave their house and they go to Canaan and they set up there and they just wait for God to do what he promised that he will do. And I want you to trust in the promises of God. That when you're open scripture and you're reading it and God says, I love you with an everlasting love, then you go, I don't know. Really? Maybe? You go, that, that's for me. That God loves me with an everlasting love. That's, that's for me. I can apply that. That, that. That's God's promise to me. You would start seeing God's promises leap off the pages of this book and that God has made them to you. God has just made them to other people. He has made them to you. And he wants to fulfill them in you. And he wants to see them happen in you. And he wants you to trust him, that he will do what he says he will do always. There's never a moment where he gives up. There's never a moment where he says, no, not going to do that anymore. God will always do what he says he will do. Number two, impossible situations are God's opportunity to show everyone who he is. I, that's all he said. You cannot read this story and go, huh, wow. I wonder what drug they took, okay, that, that just helped uh, make all of this happen. I, you know, I, I, w- I wonder what luck they ran into. I wonder what, you don't leave this story thinking about anything else other than, wow, look what God did. That's how you're supposed to leave this story. Pushing everything else aside, every other chance, luck, circumstance, whatever, and you arrive at a single conclusion. God did this. The possible situations are God's opportunity to show everyone who he is. They are his opportunity. And quite often, sometimes the things we get ourselves into, right? We get ourselves into some really good messes and and some situations that we don't know what's going to happen and we don't know what's going to take place and we're not sure. I'm saying if you invited God into those situations, say, okay, God, It's pretty impossible. I have no idea what's going to happen. I have no idea what's going to take place. And I'm just asking you to show up and do something in this situation that I have no idea what is going to happen. When's the last time you asked God to do that? Because some of you are in in the room. Some of you are in them right now. You're in situations where you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what's taking place. You're not sure how it's going to work out. Have why did God into that is my question to you. Are we just said, oh, no, I can't bother God. He's busy in other parts of the world because there's lots of trouble there. I can't bother God. I don't know if God would care about this. I don't know if God would want to do anything about this. I'm asking you, would you please this morning invite God into that situation, into that relationship that seems impossible, that, oh, it'll never work out. It's never going to be what it was. Uh, it's never going to be the same again. We'll never be friends again. It's just all, it's just all a mess, and it's never going to work. Have you invited God into that situation? Have you invited God into your workplace that seems hard and difficult? Have you invited God into the situations that are causing you a lot of stress right now and causing you to lose sleep because you don't know what's going to happen and you may be not sure what decision you should make right now and how you should move forward and what you should do next? Have you invited God into that situation to work when the situation seems impossible? That's, that's my request today. Would you just invite God to step into that, to step into that moment, to step into that relationship, to step in that workplace, and do what only he can do? Because there's no way out of this other than, wow, look what God did. Wow. God, only God can do the impossible. Only God is the one who is in charge of the womb. Only God is the one in charge of life. And if you don't walk away from this story understanding that life is in the hands of God, 
you might miss another big lesson along the way too. That life is in the hands of God, that we entrust it to him, and that he knows what he is doing. I think one of the biggest misconceptions we have, and I, I haven't talked about this for a while, uh, but scripture does not talk about that life begins at conception, okay? That, that's something we talk about a lot um, in, in our world, in our place, okay? That's not how scripture talks about it. You know scripture talks about it? That life begins in the mind of God far before there is any conception, okay? That's when life begins. That is how you know that the circumstances surrounding your birth have nothing to do with what God thinks of you. That's how you know that. And if you're like, oh, yeah, but the situation of my birth, and my parents weren't married, and that was bad, and, and maybe you don't even know who one of your parents is, or your parents were terrible, I am telling you, that does not weigh on your identity and your worth in God's eyes. Why? Because their act did not do everything. God did it. And when we understand that it changes the way we think about life, it changes the way we think about ourselves, it changes our entire identity because we understand God stepped in and he did that. So impossible situations like the one you're in is God's opportunity to show up and show everyone who he is. Number three, unwavering faith. 25 years. I'm telling you, you just got to let that sit, okay? Because I don't know about you. Maybe you people are all patient and wonderful and you can wait on God, okay? I don't know about you. That's not me, okay? That is not me, okay? That is not me, okay? So, so yesterday, um, we're in Lincoln, which I guess their team lost, and they're all in mourning today, I guess. I don't know. But uh, anyway, uh, so, so we're there. We're moving in yesterday. Now, now I would like, I'd like God to have done this, you know, several years ago, right? Why, why, why wouldn't you do this before, okay? Uh, well, that's not God's plan. That wasn't God's timing, okay? So I, that's why I said, I don't know about you. I am very impatient. I'm like, come on, God. Go go. You know, understand. It's 2021. Let's go. Let's go. Uh, let, do something. Do this. Do what I want you to do. And that's just the way, way I am. And so uh, that means that affects unwavering faith. Because I'm really ready to wait on God, even if he takes 25 years. Am I really going to wait on God? But this unwavering faith, that we see in Abraham. And wait till next week. Woo! Next week you can see it really, really come through. Okay? This unwavering faith in Abraham for 25 years. Do you know what that comes from? A long obedience in the same direction. He just kept following and following and trusting. And yeah, did he get things wrong? Yep, yep. He had days where he got things wrong. He had seasons where they got things wrong. But he just keeps following and following and following. It's just a long obedience in the same direction. He just keeps going for 25 years. He doesn't go for a year and give up or two years and quit. He doesn't just pack up and go back home because, well, God didn't come through. This didn't work. He just keeps going, believing this promise, believing what God's going to do. He just keeps marching in that direction. He just keeps going, keeps obeying, keeps doing. So for 25 years, he kept following, he kept serving, he kept doing everything that God asked him to do. That's what he did for 25 years. He didn't sit around and do nothing. Well, God, I'm going to do nothing until you show up. And 25 years later, where are you? This Abraham, this 100-year-old Abraham is not 75-year-old Abraham. It's not the guy who left his father. It's not the guy who packed up and moved out. This is a man of unwavering faith in a God he just met 25 years ago. Why? Because every day was a new day to follow. Spiritual maturity is so much about getting up every day and following God in all the circumstances of our lives and watching God show up and do what God's going to do when God decides to do it. Okay? It, it, it isn't I just do nothing. It's I serve, I use my God-given gifts, I take what God has given to me, and I serve and I, and I give out of all that God has given to me. That's what we do every single day while following God in this long obedience in the same direction. The people you admire the most in their faith didn't walk up someday and poof, it all happened. They've been doing this for years, but it's done in silence done behind the scenes. You don't see it. 
You, you don't see the Bible being opened and read. You don't see the prayers that are opened up. You don't see the things that are happening day after day. See, we got snippets of 25 years. We didn't see, we didn't get to peek in every single day and went, what was every day like? What's going to happen? We saw a couple have an unwavering faith in God from just waking up every day and being in obedience and doing that over and over and over and over again. And I know some of you are in this season that we're going to talk about next, okay? This whole idea of waiting. Do you realize it's always worth the wait with God? And I can't tell you how long that wait's going to be. I can just tell you Abraham had 25 years of waiting. Of waiting, of waiting, of waiting, of waiting, of waiting. And finally, God does what he ultimately promises he could do. Some of you are in a year of waiting. Some of you, maybe five, maybe 15, maybe some of you are in these long seasons of going, okay, is God even listening? Because I'm not sure. It's been a long time. I want you to take a little bit of encouragement this morning from Abraham. 25 years. I don't know if I can wait for something that long, okay? I'm, I'm speaking honestly this morning. That's a long, long time to wait for something, okay? I want God to act, and I want him to act now. Like, like I, I, I just, I want him to just, okay, you already know, Father, what I'm going to pray, so just do it before I even ask. Well, maybe even better, you just show up and do it, do it, do it. And some of you are losing a little bit of trust in God because the wait's been long. It's been long. And you're just, oh, God, I'm not sure. I am not sure. And I'm telling you, don't give up on the wait. Part of what I think is missing the story of the prodigal son is how long. Do you realize we're never told how long? We are never told how long the father is watching for the son to return. We're never told how long he's partying. We're never told how long it took for the money to run out. We are never told how long it took that, that he finally got a job feeding the pigs. And we're not even told how long he fed the pigs until he went, well, this is dumb, I should go home, okay? There is no timetable in any of that. And I kind of wish, how long? How long? Let's just consider it was long. And every day the father gets up, and what does he do? He goes to the place where he watches for his son to come home. Every day. Day after day, month after month, year after year, until the son finally comes home. Some of you are waiting for a prodigal. Some of you are waiting for other things in your life. Okay? I'm telling you, it's always worth the wait with God. Keep trusting. Keep holding on in the midst of all the waiting that you are going through. I know it's hard. I know it's difficult. I know there is nothing in us that makes us want to wait. We want it now, and we want it quickly. And God so often works in us while we are Faithfulness. Why, why we call Abraham such a, such, a, such a hero of the faith in Hebrews 11? Because when they look back on his story, when we look back on his story, the faithfulness ex- accumulated over time and trust. You can't rush faithfulness. You can't. You can't microwave it, okay? You can't air fry it. You can't make it happen fast, okay? You just can't. It is accumulated over time and over trust. And the faithful people we want to be in the future, okay, that we want someone to look at our life and say, wow, they were faithful. I'm telling you, that's accumulated over time and trust. It's every day getting up and going in that direction, that long obedience, and just keep going to do it. How are you doing doing during the wait? And it's okay if you say, I don't like the weights. I'm with you, okay? I am with you. I don't like it either. But what God wants to do in the weights is far more important than what he wants to do in the now. So let's wait and let's lean into that and see what God wants to do in us to ultimately through us. So let me pray for us this morning. And we're just going to ask God to help us. I I don't know all your situations. Some of you are in this waiting and, and it's driving you crazy. Okay? And I'm just going to ask God to remind you, he is there, he is working, wait, and just continue to obey. 
a long obedience in the same direction. Keep walking, keep following, see what God wants to do. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you know I am an impatient person. I don't like waiting. Because I want what I want, and I want it now. And I'm just not good. But what you want to do in us is just it's the weight works in us. And we become faithful people when that gets accumulated over time and we're trusting you and going in that long obedience in the same direction. So, Father, I want to pray for those watching, listening here in the room who are in this waiting, and they feel like quitting, and they feel like giving up, and they hear the whispers of the enemy saying, God doesn't care about you, that you would silence that voice. And you would help them to keep walking today. Help them keep walking tomorrow. That long obedience in the same direction. I don't know how long it will take. I just know, Father, you always fulfill your promises. And I pray we walk away with that certainty that Abraham had, that you were going to do what you said you were going to do. It took 25 years, but you did what you said that you would do. So work in us, in the waiting. Work in us, in the uncertainty. Work in us, in the impossible situations. That we would trust you more and be considered faithful because we followed you through everything. Father, work in us, work in us. Remind us you are always faithful. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.